Počinje još jedan podcast Mrežnica i želim vam dobrodošlicu. Bit će ovo naš prvi online podcast iz jednostavnog razloga jer se naš gost nalazi u Sjedinjenim američkim državama. A on je svjetski poznati ekonomist i politički analitičar profesor Jeffrey Sachs. Smatraju ga jednim od trojice najutjecajnijih ekonomista na svijetu. Direktor je Centra za održivi razvoj na sveučilištu Kolumbija, a prije toga više od 20 godina bio je profesor na Harvardu. Savjetovao je čak trojicu glavnih tajnika Ujedinjenih naroda, Banki Muna, Kofi Anana i Antonija Gutereša. Profesor Saks bio je i ekonomski savjetnik u Sovjetskom savezu i to dvojici predsjednika Mihajlu Gorbačovu i Borisu Jelcinu. Savjetovao je i Poljski pokret Solidarnost, ali i vladu tadašnjeg poljskog premijera Tadeuša Mazovjetskog. Jeffrey Sachs savjetovao je i posljednjeg jugoslavenskog premijera Antu Markovića i pomogao mu izraditi ekonomski program po kojem će Marković ostati prepoznat. Jeffrey Sachs posvetio je život smanjenju društvenih nejednakosti i okončanju globalnog siromaštva. Autor je i urednik brojnih knjiga, uključujući tri bestsellera New York Timesa, Kraj siromaštva, Ekonomija za prenatrpan planet i Cijena civilizacije. Časopis Time dva Dva put ga je uvrstio među stotinu najutjecajnijih osoba na svijetu. Danas je profesor Saks jedan od rijetkih koji se ne libi iznijeti stavove suprotne zapadnom mainstreamu i zapravo narativu koji vlada od rata u Ukrajini pa nadalje. Smatraju ga jednim od vodećih svjetskih političkih analitičara koji vrlo razumno zaziva mir i objašnjava javnosti potku svjetskih događaja. Prije nekoliko mjeseci dao je bombastični intervju američkom novinaru Takeru Carlsonu. U njemu je izjavio kako rat u Ukrajini dirigira CIA, a u svojim intervjuima ne ustručava se kritizirati Zapad. Mnogi ga nazivaju rijetkim glasom razuma u današnjem svijetu i vrhunskim intelektualcem. Ne čudi stoga što i dio američke javnosti želi upravo profesora Saksa vidjeti u bijeloj kući. Danas je gost podcasta Mrešnica. Professor Sachs, it's a, it is an honor to have you with us today. Welcome to our podcast. I'm delighted to be together with you. Thank you. The world is becoming increasingly complicated and geopolitical events have been quite hectic lately. If we look at the latest development in the Middle East, we get the impression that Israel is the absolute master of the Middle East. What is the source of this power? Well, it, it wants to be the master of the Middle East. Uh, I don't think things will go very well. Uh, there are uh, powerful adversaries of Israel, and they should not be discounted. Uh, Iran is not a pushover. It's not a small place. It's not a technologically backward place. Uh, it has a powerful military, and it has powerful allies. And Israel is deliberately provoking it. Uh, Now, what Israel wants is for the United States to go to war with Iran. Uh, Israel isn't so powerful. The United States is powerful. And the United States uh, uh, is being uh, dragged into a war by Israel if Israel gets its way. So this is the dynamic, in my opinion, of what's happening. Netanyahu wants a region-wide war because he believes that he has effective control over U.S. policy. Uh, he's the one that gets the standing ovations in Washington, not Biden. Uh, he thinks that he can uh, really determine uh, what uh, the U.S. is going to do militarily. He boasted at the U.N. last week that Israel has a strong arm that reaches across the Middle East. But uh, Netanyahu either was delusional or he was talking about the United States. <laughs> and so, uh, and, and maybe he wasn't delusional, maybe he... Uh, Maybe he's right that uh, he has the U.S. in his pocket, but that's what this is about. You recently said that Israel's uh, ideology of genocide must be stopped. Is it possible to restore peace at this point of the conflict, and who can do it? Could the U.N. do more to bring peace uh, to this region? Well, peace uh, could uh, come in about an hour uh, if... Uh, the President of the United States uh, told uh, the Prime Minister of Israel, uh, your, your war's over, we're going a different direction. Now, it's not going to happen with Biden. 
Uh, it may never happen uh, because of the uh, power uh, of, of the Israel lobby, which is shocking to me. But uh, it should happen, and it could happen. In the past, uh, it has happened. You know, back in 1956, in one of the most famous episodes, uh, Israel, France, and Britain decided that they would uh, capture the Suez Canal. Nasser had uh, nationalized it, and uh, Britain uh, still uh, believed it was the British Empire, uh, and uh, Israel had the same uh, arrogance that it has today. Uh, and so they went to war. Uh, they thought they would capture the Suez Canal. And uh, Eisenhower, uh, president, uh, uh, who was a, a general, also told them, stop, go home, your little war is over, and it was the end of it. Uh, it was, it's usually the date that is put for the kind of definitive end of the British Empire because uh, uh, Eisenhower just told the British, stop, <laughs> we run the show, not you. Uh, now, the truth is nobody is running this show anymore. The United States is far from all powerful, but it is virtually all powerful vis-a-vis -vis Israel because without the U.S. arms, funding, intelligence, weaponry, uh, tactical support, CIA support, all the rest, Israel would not be able to fight another day. You understand the economic and geopolitical situation in the US, China, and in Europe, of course. Can we say that everything is leading to the World War III? Are you afraid of nuclear war and is it even possible? Right now, we're on a path to World War III. Uh, and remember that world wars uh, erupt uh, even when they're not expected. Uh, in, in your own neighborhood, uh, in Sarajevo, who thought that uh, a, a, a killing uh, in uh, the summer of 1914 of senior, uh, a, a, the, a senior member of uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire but after all, an archduke, that that would trigger uh, World War I. Uh, well, of course, uh, the world was poised for war with blocks that were opposing each other, distrust, uh, certain militaries itching for war, and uh, complete disaster struck, uh, in which uh, everybody paid a catastrophic price, and in some ways still pay a price for that war. After all, the wars in the Middle East today emerged from World War I uh, and from the British imperial craziness, I'll put it that way, uh, the, the arrogance of how Britain uh, repeatedly tried to redraw maps in the world. Now, all of that is to say that um, we're always close to war, actually. Uh, and when our politicians say, oh, don't be afraid, Putin's bluffing, don't worry, you better damn well worry. Uh, these politicians don't know very much. They're not very bright. Uh, they have a long history of uh, bloody mindedness, I'm afraid. Uh, in my country, it's been nonstop war my whole lifetime. So I don't trust them for a minute, frankly. Uh, and uh, when we are already in a hot war with Russia in Ukraine, and we have ridiculous statements by the British and by the Americans saying, don't worry, it's a bluff. My God, what kind of language is this? Uh, or the hate talk from the, uh, the Israeli government uh, to go to the podium of uh, the UN and just uh, talk hate towards Iran. Th this, of course, uh, sets us up for disaster. Uh, and we should have a minimum standard that our politicians behave like adults, uh, and they don't. Yes. Uh, the conflict in the Middle East has put the war in Ukraine on the back burner. Uh, since the beginning of the war in Ukraine, some consider it as a war between Russia and the West. You have been strongly advocating for peace, while the establishment of the West and the mainstream media's pro-war propaganda claim that the conflict must continue, even if it lasts for decades. 
Do you think that Ukraine and the West have already lost uh, the war? And if so, when will they admit it? Ukraine uh, is losing one to 2,000 people every day. Uh, people are getting dragged off the street. You see the videos uh, all over Ukraine. They're getting put in these cars. Uh, they're shoved with a gun uh, and they're sent to the front lines and they're dead within a few days. Uh, so no, the war can't go on for decades. There aren't enough Ukrainians for the war to go on for decades. Uh, this idea that the US will fight to the last Ukrainian, unfortunately has a literal ring to it because uh, while we don't know how many Ukrainians have died by now, a reasonable estimate is around 600,000. Uh, and this is completely shocking. And this is blood on the hands of Biden and on the American leadership uh, and on Zelensky and others. Because why do I say that? Because it was completely obvious more than two and a half years ago that it would go this way. Uh, what's all this talk? We're going to defeat Russia. Are you kidding? Russia's got 6,000 nuclear warheads. It's a powerful country. When's the last time it was defeated? Did Hitler defeat Russia? No. Is Ukraine going to defeat Russia? Come on. Yeah. So, you know, the difference now is that we have nuclear weapons. So even if Russia were being defeated, do you think it's going to stay a conventional war? And Russia is going to say, oh, I'm so sorry, we're defeated by uh, Ukraine. We surrender. I don't think so. It's obvious from the start that this was a, a reckless approach by the U.S. Why do I say by the U.S.? Because contrary to all of the propaganda in our mass media, this war did not start on February 24th, 2022. Uh, if you needed to pick one date, uh, it was February 22nd, 2014, when the president of Ukraine was overthrown by right-wing forces in Ukraine together with the U.S. government, the CIA, others that were engaged in a coup. And Russia explained all of this by intercepting a call by Victoria Newland and the U.S. Ambassador uh, Jeffrey Piat uh, in late January 2014, when they were picking the new government of Ukraine. Oh, it should not be uh, Klitschko. It should be Yatsenuk. This is the American <laughs> and the American Assistant Secretary of State and the U.S. Ambassador talking about who they are picking for the new Prime Minister of. Ukraine. You, you couldn't make it up. Uh, and if and if it were said, it would be denied, except that the Russians caught it on tape and posted it. And so we all see it. And, you know, another interesting thing for people to look at is the memo written by our current CIA director, William Burns, in 2008, sent back to uh, Condoleezza Rice in Washington, saying that it's not just Putin that opposes NATO enlargement, to Ukraine, it's the entire Russian political class. And that Russia's afraid if the US keeps pushing this way, there's gonna be a civil war in Ukraine because the people didn't want NATO. Oh, some people in Western Ukraine uh, wanted NATO, but a lot of the country, most of the country was against it. Uh, Yanukovych won the election for president in 2010. He had to be overthrown so that the NATO enlargement could continue. But you have to understand the US mindset. They don't care. They're, they think they're playing poker. Uh, they're playing poker with Ukrainian lives. So this is what continues to drive this complete debacle. Uh, and they thought, well, they'd bluff Putin uh, or NATO would enlarge, what could Putin do? That's what they thought. And then when he started this special military operation, oh, we'll crush him. Uh, look how that worked out. Uh, and then they said, oh, we're going to drive Russia to its knees with economic sanctions. Well, look at how that brilliant move worked out. So it's been 
it's been like a game for these people in Washington. They don't count the dead. They don't care that it's 600,000 dead and that Ukraine is losing on the battlefield every day. And by the way, Jan Stoltenberg, a case in point, he was Secretary General of NATO until last week. He said one absurd thing after another. Occasionally, he told the truth. Once he said, of course, this is a war about NATO. Uh, we said NATO, Russia said no, so we went to war. But we were going to have more NATO. That's when he told a, a moment of truth. Uh, but up until the, the moment that he wasn't uh, the Secretary General of NATO, he said, Ukraine's going to win. And then he stopped being Secretary General, his term ended, and uh, he gave an interview saying, well, Ukraine's going to have to give up some territory. Well, which one is it, Mr. Stoltenberg? Why, why don't you tell the truth in the first place? When I asked that recently of a very senior European official, they gave me a very straightforward answer. They said, Jeff, do you know what the job of Secretary General of NATO is? And I said, yes. And, uh, the, and they said, uh, yes, it is to speak for the United States. Oh. That's not exactly how I would define the job, but that is the job because NATO is the U.S., where all the European politicians, God only knows where they ran away to. Uh, there are only a couple that speak honestly. But the U.S. is calling the shots. The U.S. wants NATO to surround Russia. That's uh, not a new idea. That goes back to 1990. It actually goes back to Lord Palmerston uh, in 1853 in, when he was uh, uh, when he was leading the Crimean War for Britain. Of course, it wasn't about NATO then. It was about Britain surrounding Russia in the Black Sea region. Uh, but this is an old story. It's just such a terrible disaster for Ukraine, completely predictable, completely avoidable, and it's got to stop. Now, when is it going to stop? Well, Zelensky uh, isn't going to stop it. Uh, maybe his life is on the line. That's what uh, Ukrainians tell me. If he stopped it, he'll be killed by his own uh, people. Uh, maybe true, maybe not. But he's presiding over one to 2,000 Ukrainians dead every day for nothing, for nothing, because this is going to go to negotiations. It is going to be stopped. And, but they don't care, it seems, of when. So how many more people need to die before this ends? Uh, your statement that the war in Ukraine is being conducted by the CIA in an interview with Tucker Carlson was explosive. What were the consequences of that? Did you receive any friendly calls? No, but the, the point is, is the following. We've had a policy agenda in the United States actually going back to 1945. And the policy agenda has been that uh, the Soviet Union, which was mainly Russia, was the U.S. adversary, uh, and um, the end of the Soviet Union didn't change that view. That's uh, what you would call a deep state view. Uh, so this is not even something that dates, certainly, let me just explain to everybody, that what's, what we're observing is not something that started in 2022 with uh, President Putin suddenly deciding he wanted to be Peter the Great. This, this is... Uh, this is kind of the absurdity of a public relations salesman uh, in Washington who makes up such stupid lines to see how stupid the mass media can be in the United States. The answer is they can be very stupid. So they repeated that uh, dozens of times. The New York Times, the lead propagandist that the war was unprovoked. You couldn't get them to say anything beforehand. Then you could date it back, as I said, to 2014, when uh, the U.S. conspired to overthrow Yanukovych. By the way, then the New York Times actually ran an interesting story a few weeks ago saying that the CIA set up operations all over Ukraine after 2014 uh, <laughs> to, to provoke Russia, basically, of course. That's, that's what it's supposed to do. 
but you can go back before 2014 because you can go back to 1994. That's when Clinton uh, gave the uh, decision that NATO would expand eastward, despite the promise that the U.S. had made to Gorbachev that NATO would not move one inch eastward. Uh, so you could go back to 1994. Uh, you could actually go back to 1991, because when the Soviet Union ended, uh, we had uh, people like Wolfowitz uh, in the U.S. government that said, OK, now the U.S. is the world's sole superpower. Now we can do what we want. So that went back to 1991. But you can actually go back to 1945, to tell you the truth, because uh, even though Stalin and the Soviet Union were allies of the U.S. and Britain, and not just allies, they were the force that that broke Hitler's army. They were the force that actually defeated fascism. It wasn't even weeks after the uh, German surrender that the United States government took the decision that the Soviet Union was the new enemy. Not even weeks. In fact, we know uh, it's a shocking thing. I am still coming to grips with it because even though everyone knew it, I didn't know it until recently, uh, that uh, Churchill gave the order to the British high command. What about continuing the war right on to the Soviet Union? Uh, Operation Unthinkable. In the spring of 1945, my God, are these people crazy? This was an ally that lost 27 million people to Hitler. Then we say, well, Stalin was a paranoid. Yeah, but he had enemies, you know, uh, Churchill, Truman, uh, the CIA was set up for this purpose. He had enemies from the beginning. This has been a long standing idea of the US. Now, my main point is very simple which is we don't need these wars. They're not getting us anything. We don't need the war in Ukraine. We don't need the war uh, in the Middle East. We don't need the war that we had in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Syria, in Libya, you name it. These are so-called wars of choice and they're completely reckless and they're part of this American dream that it can do what it wants, where it wants, when it wants. And this is, European leaders should know. I thought, I had hoped that Europe learned something by the two world wars. I'm not sure, but I thought that Europe had learned something, which is that the wars can never solve problems for anybody. There's no such thing as victors and losers. Everybody loses from this. And now we're in the nuclear age and we're still playing the same games with the same propaganda, the same rhetoric, and so on as, as we did uh, in the past. The world is waiting for the results of the elections in the USA. Who can bring peace to Ukraine? Kamala Harris, Donald Trump, or no one? Do you believe that the war in Ukraine can be stopped immediately, as Trump says? Yes, it can. Uh, either could bring it. Uh, uh, President Putin said something very interesting in an interview uh, in, in Figaro uh, in 2017. Uh, at, by that point, he said that he had dealt with three U.S. presidents. And he said, you know, they come into office and they have ideas. But then men in dark suits show up with blue ties and they explain the reality to these people. Uh, and that's the end of their ideas. Uh, and so he was describing his experience, but I think it's an apt description. The U.S. has a security state. It's the Pentagon, the National Security Agency, the CIA, the arms contractors, and so on. Uh, our foreign policy is not set by president by president. It's, as I've emphasized, it's been pretty much consistent now for almost 80 years. It didn't even change at the end of the Cold War, believe it or not. Uh, it, we kept the Cold War going, even though we told the Soviet Union, we, they said we're ending the Cold War. We said we're ending the Cold War, but we kept the Cold War going uh, and uh, kept right on uh, with the Cold War, although it wasn't so clear for about uh, 10 years. Uh, then it became more and more clear. But uh, 
the presidents don't decide all that much. Uh, the deep state does. But I keep hoping the deep state will realize this is absolutely not in America's interest. The whole idea of America as the sole superpower was always a delusion, but it's so wildly out of date right now that it could really get us killed. So I try to write articles that I hope someone in Washington reads and little books saying we have to stop this delusion. Uh, there are nuclear weapons all over the place. Uh, there's a powerful China. There's the BRICS countries. Uh, we're not the sole superpower. Now, Biden is an old man. Uh, he's 81 years old. Uh, when you watch him, well, you don't know what he's going to say the next moment, but uh, he repeats things uh, basically from the 1990s. So the slogans, the, the U.S. is the sole superpower, the world looks to the U.S. for leadership, blah, blah, blah. Come on, it's a different world. I see the world every day traveling. Uh, China's not looking to the U.S. for leadership. It would like a little sanity. It would like a little calm. It would like a little peace. Russia's not looking to have a war with the United States. It doesn't want storm shadow missiles being targeted at Moscow, which the British want, because the British never have any self-control, because, by the way, they're using the American military. Uh, so it's, anyway, the, the main point is the war could end immediately, because all that needs to happen is the president of the United States. It could be President Trump or it could be President Harris after uh, talking with the uh, the men in dark suits and blue ties uh, mm -hmm. they they could pick up the phone and they could uh, call and they could say uh, mr putin mr president uh, that idea of nato enlargement to ukraine and to georgia that was a pretty bad idea so we'll say publicly we'll put it in a treaty with you that's over uh, we don't really mean to have a nuclear war with you. We don't need our military base right on your border. We don't need to put our Aegis missile systems in Ukraine. You're right. That's a security issue for you. We wouldn't like it if you did it in Mexico either. So why don't we just call it a day? This was a bad idea. Uh, and uh, let's uh, have peace. So we'll say that publicly and you will stop fighting immediately. And that would be a deal that would be acceptable. And then they would work out the details. Uh, what are the borders? Uh, How is it going to work? What's the demilitarization? But the basic point is Russia feels directly threatened by the United States, and it has been repeatedly. And may, that may sound strange to people, but the U.S. has been in the business of overthrowing other governments and launching wars for a long time. So if a country says they feel threatened, by having the US military on their border. It's not an incredible idea. It's, it's actually a quite plausible idea. Europe is in an economic crisis. Are dark times ahead of us? You are well acquainted with the global economic situation. Are we approaching a new global economic collapse? If so, who will be to blame? Look, uh, if it weren't for the war, uh, and some other instability. I, d I don't want to go into COVID right now, but uh, that was another episode that, that actually has political roots, uh, and I, I don't want to go there right now. But uh, if it weren't for this instability, one could say something quite important about Europe. By every objective standard, Europe has the highest quality of life in the world. I measure such things for a living. I produce a world happiness report. I produce a sustainable development report. All the countries at the top of both lists are European. You gotta love Europe. It's got phenomenal food, life expectancy, culture, history, beauty, uh, cities that are two or 3,000 years old, which you, know, you can't make up. Uh, you can only enjoy them. Uh, and benefit from them. Europe has everything, uh, but Europe's great strength is peace. Europe's strength is not war. So for Europe to go into the war business again 
would be the huge disaster. But the United States is telling Europe, you, you got to get back to the war business. You have to hate Russia. Every day you have to get up and you have to condemn Russia for being evil. Uh, you have to have uh, the Baltic states uh, say Russia must be destroyed. You have to have your new uh, 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 high representative uh, for Europe say that Russia should be broken into little pieces. This is the high representative for Europe? Well, then Europe could lose everything. But if Europe said, hey, we like being at the top of the list for well-being. We like being at the top of the list for happiness. We like being at the top of the list for sustainable development. We like being at the top of the list for life expectancy. We, we actually liked what we learned after World War II, that peace was much better than war. Uh, we like being a union. We like having a European Green Deal because that inspires the whole rest of the world to get on with sustainability. If Europe did that, it would be safe. It would be admired. It would be visited as it is, of course, by everybody in the world because everybody loves Europe. That's what Europe should be doing, not becoming an appendage of NATO, for God's sake. The U.S. is a little crazy. Uh, the U.S. wants to run the world. Europe doesn't need to run the world. Europe needs to run Europe, be happy, and inspire other places uh, to have uh, peace and an internal union. And by the way, there was every prospect for good relations between Europe and Russia all along. I was Gorbachev's economic advisor, one of them. I was Yeltsin's economic advisor. I know they wanted peace, a common European home, trade. They wanted to catch up after decades of the uh, terrible system that they had. They, they didn't want renewed war. For God's sake, they didn't want to invade Europe is crazy. Uh, we should have disbanded NATO back in 1991 when the Warsaw Pact was disbanded. Everyone could live at peace. But no, the United States had to decide immediately. Ah, now we go on to dismantle Russia, too, because the U.S. wants domination. It didn't want peace. It wants dominance. Now, again, it's an old fashioned, old outmoded, anachronistic, and very dangerous idea. So we need a new foreign policy. But you asked me, could peace come? It could come instantaneously if the United States would adopt a more realistic view. Okay, uh, and now for my final question, the Croatian government has so far given about 300 million euros in aid to Ukraine. At the same time, Croatian pensioners receive an average pension, pension of around 350 euros for 40 years of work. How do you comment this? Look, get together with your neighbors, get together with, uh, with Viktor Orban, with uh, Roberto Fizzo, uh, get together with all the people who are winning the elections actually across Europe, uh, because the ones that are winning the elections are the ones, they call them right wing, but the truth is the ones that are winning the elections are the ones that say, we don't like this war, we wanna get back to peace. And so this is uh, really what uh, Croatia should do. Uh, it's ex war is expensive and it's very dangerous. Uh, and uh, Croatia, like everyone else, would benefit from Russian tourists and benefit from uh, nice relations with Russia and uh, all the rest. They've got money to spend. Uh, uh, Croatia has some of the most beautiful places in the whole planet. Uh, right. And so this should be a peaceful country. Don't get caught up in this crazy spiral of violence and rhetoric and hatred. There's no basis for it. Uh, there's no basis for what's going on. Russia does not need or want more land. It wants the United States to respect it and to not threaten its security. This is what Russia wants. Uh, and Russia should get that because as an American, it's not doing me one whit of good. It's only making my life more dangerous when NATO tries to expand. I'm sick of it too, because it just puts me under a nuclear risk that I don't want to be under. That's the only risk, by the way, the United States faces. No one's going to invade the United States. And no one's going to attack the United States. 
the only single security risk of the United States conceivable is a nuclear war. So if they had a wit of sense about them, that's what they'd be trying to avoid rather than saying, oh, Putin's, we, we should call his bluff. He's just bluffing. All these idiots, you know, want to provoke to the point that, oh, sorry, we made a mistake, at which point the world's over. So uh, this is uh, my advice to Croatia. You have plenty of neighbors that figure this out, figure it out too. Everybody should get together. Uh, by the way, uh, even uh, Petr Pavel in, uh, the, in uh, Czech Republic, uh, who has been NATO, pro-NATO, pro-NATO, recently uh, said realistically, you know, Ukraine cannot win this war. So there's more common sense coming in the neighborhood now. Get together with the people of common sense and tell the Americans some truth. Great. Professor Sachs, thank you very much for this interview. Great to be with you. I appreciate it. Thank you once again. Good. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I bio je ovo još jedan podcast Mrežnica. Hvala vam na pozornosti i vidimo se vrlo brzo.